So uh, I'm giving this uh, this tutorial about distance geometry and data science. This is a tutorial, so many of you may know many of the things I'm saying, but um, there'll be some students, some PhD students who uh, don't know, perhaps. And uh, so um, on top of introducing some notions from distance geometry, I'll do my best to introduce also and relate uh, these notions to um, some to data science. Uh, most of the material has been taken from this paper here. It's a long paper. It's not quite a book, but it's a long paper. It's a survey. And you can download it from here if you want. Okay. I will be, um, these slides, I can send them whether they're, they're not quite finished yet. Uh, my third lecture is still not finished, but uh, when they're over, I can send them to Henry or, or to Tony and they will post them somewhere. Okay. Um, so, um, this is this is uh, a grayed out a contents page, um, and uh, so you can see some of the contents that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with distance geometry's best known result, which is Heron's theorem, and this is just a warm up to tell you what distance geometry really is, or what it's about. Um, Heron's theorem, I think you've all seen it at some point. I mean, I've seen it. I'm pretty sure I'm, I've seen it in primary school, maybe end of primary school. I don't know, maybe beginning of secondary school. I don't remember anymore. But basically it says, it teaches you how to compute the area of a triangle from the side lengths, okay? Instead of having to apply a, an unwieldy formula um, in, including involving the height of a triangle, uh, you can only just, you know, walk around your triangle, count the number of steps, and then find out the area. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure this was useful for uh, for agricultural land because, I mean, imagine walking perpendicularly to one of the sides, where uh, whatever the next door farmer or the next field farmer was saying, no, no, you're not walking perpendicularly, and uh, you know he was trying to steal some of your land, or maybe you're trying to steal in some of yours, some of his. Anyway, so Heron lived around the year zero. And he hung out and was a student, well, a researcher at Alexandria's famous library. Um, so the area, uh, Heron's theorem says that this formula here is the area, uh, area of a triangle, okay? And A, B, and C are the uh, length of its sides. I am exploiting a high school student's brilliant proof to prove Heron's theorem to you. So I've read up many of the proofs of Heron's theorem and most of them are very complicated, meaning that they are elementary, of course, they use elementary mathematics, but they are what seems to me unnecessarily, unnecessarily unwieldy. Um, so this um, Mr. Edwards, um, who was a high school student in, in 2007, provided a beautiful proof, in my opinion. Uh, I, I've tried to... Um, to find him, to, to thank him for the proof, but I couldn't find him, I couldn't get in touch with him. He would not answer any of the old email addresses that I found online. Anyway, so if, if you know of this Mr. Edwards, please let me know. Um, so he's using complex analysis or, or some notions from complex analysis in order to, uh, to, um, to, to prove this result. Okay, so there are two parts of this proof. The first part that I labeled A, um, basically starts from the fact that if you um, if you look at a whole um, round angle, okay, uh, that's two pi. All right. So uh, you have I have labeled these things alpha, alpha, gamma, gamma, beta, beta, and they all correspond and they all correspond to um, a part of the corresponding side. So here you have side A, side B, and side C of the triangle, okay? And I'm, um, I'm also looking at these uh, smaller triangles like this, okay? And the perpendiculars here, okay? So these perpendiculars divide these sides into two parts, which have been labeled X for this part and Z for this part and Y for that part, okay? So let me clean everything so you can see better. All right, so alpha, beta, and gamma, we now know what they are. They are these, uh, these angles here, okay? And if you sum up twice alpha plus twice, be twice beta plus twice, uh, twice gamma, you get two pi because it's a whole round angle, okay? So that means 
that if you sum up half of them, alpha plus beta plus gamma, you get pi, all right? So what is now this a length u? What is this length v? How do we express these lengths w's? How do, you do we express these lengths in function of r and x? Uh, by Obviously by trigonometry, uh, we know that um, we can write r, okay, plus i times x, i would be the square root of minus one, equal to u times e to the i alpha, okay? So u, uh, this would be the amplitude of your complex number, and i times alpha, which is the angle, okay? You can see that all of this makes perfect sense. And you can do the same for r plus i y and r plus y z, okay? So you get these quantities here that are complex, I'm sorry, these quantities, all right? So now we multiply together all of the quantities on the left-hand sides, all right? And we uh, obtain the multiplication of the quantities on the right hand side, okay, which is very easy to do. So now what we get is that because of this part, this exponent here is pi, all right? So e to the i times pi by Euler's formula is actually just minus one. So what we have here is that uh, the multiplication of these u, w, w, and v parts. Uh, they, uh, it turns out to be a real number, okay? What is precious about having a real number in this multiplication? Well, what is precious is that it's telling you that the complex part is zero. So if you take the imaginary part um, of this multiplication, what you get is zero. Now you multiply all together, okay? And you find out that this is what you get. And because it's zero, you take this on the other side and from this equation, you can isolate R in this way. Now we, we know what R is, okay? So we can express R in terms of X, Y, and Z in this fashion. Now we move over to part B. And in part B, we have uh, a semi-perimeter S, which is a half of A plus B plus C, of course. Um, and because it's a half of a plus b plus c, because of how I divided, uh, how I defined um, x, y, and z, it is obvious that this is x plus y plus z, all right? So now s minus a, the semi-perimeter minus a, is simply x plus y plus z minus um, the expression for a. a is y plus z, so minus y plus z, will get, will give you minus, oops, uh, minus y minus z, okay? And so this goes away with this and all you get is x, all right? So the same holds for s minus b and s minus c. And now the area is the sum, the area of the triangle is the sum of the areas of all these triangular parts. And so that's um, a times r plus b times r plus c times r. And that makes R times A plus B plus C over two, which is the semi-perimeter. And now you can replace X, Y, and Z here in this formula by these things. And if you work it all out, it comes out to the uh, famous Heron's formula. So I found that this was by far the simplest of the proofs that I've seen. The only non-simple part is switching to the complex numbers, but uh, that's just a trick, you can see it. You could have done everything, everything in another way if you wanted to, but uh, that cuts off a lot of details. So I think that this is a brilliant uh, proof uh, and found apparently by a high school student. All right, now let's switch over from distance geometries, very basic result, to something a little more modern, or let's say, okay? So now a, a metric space, suppose that X and D is a, is, is a couple that describes an abstract metric space, okay? So X and it's finite. So X would be a set, a finite set of points, but these points are not in a Euclidean space, okay? They're not vectors, they're just entities, it's a set. And um, D is this function d would be a distance function defined on these elements of the set x, okay? So you can make up a distance matrix big D, okay? Where uh, each component d, i, j would be the distance between uh, element, the ith and the jth element of x. And now um, our problem is to represent this abstract metric space into Rn in such a way as to preserve 
the distances, okay? So we wanna find vectors in our N so that the distances will be the same as the given distance matrix D, okay? Now, uh, this is a, a very famous problem. Uh, well, probably one of the first problems that have been posed in this, in this area. And I always, always wondered how it would be possible, having read the statement, but not the proof, I was always wondering how it would be possible to pull out a description in terms of vector vectors from just the distance matrix. It seemed like impossible to me. Of course, I hadn't realized that there are some vectors hidden in the distance matrix. That would be, um, for example, the rows, or because the distance matrix is symmetric, the columns. Okay, so we are going to consider the i row at x i of the uh, distance matrix big D, and this row is d i one to d i n. Okay, the column will be the same. Um, so we are going to assign to the abstract element of the set X, okay, a vector UD of I, which is this row, the I throw of the distance matrix, okay? All right, so now this UD here, we wanna see it as a set itself, okay? So we're going to define another matrix, uh, another mat matrix space, UD and L infinity, okay? So UD, um, would be the set of um, rows or columns of the distance matrix of uh, this metric space, okay? And L infinity is the uh, max norm, okay? Um, so it turns out, and this is the theorem that I want to um, uh, illustrate to you, it turns out that this metric space has exactly the same distance matrix, matrix D than uh, of the uh, abstract metric space that we started with, okay? So exactly the same. And notice that this XD, this metric space that was given, uh, did not rely on any particular distances. It's an abstract metric space, but this, here now we have vectors uh, in a Euclidean space and the length is not the Euclidean length, but it's a max norm, okay? Now this, um, this way of constructing embeddings of abstract metric spaces into a Euclidean vector space, um, which always works, no matter what the metric space is, is called the universal isometric embedding, okay? And it's also known as Frechet's embedding. Um, in fact, uh, I think that the, the result was actually found by Kuratowski, but it was probably implicit in a work by Frechet. Uh, the practical issue, if we want to find, uh, to, to use this embedding, is that it is high dimensional, i.e. if you've got, uh, it's, it's in Rn, it's got n dimensions, okay? There are n uh, rows in the distance matrix and all of them have n components uh, by definition. So unfortunately, it's a little bad. It's not, it's not usable if you, have, if you have a graph, uh, well, sorry, a metric space X that has millions or billions of elements, okay? So, or it's hardly usable um, because then every vector will have a mil billions of, of uh, components and then every, every computation will take billions of CPU cycles. All right, so let's see the very simple proof again. Um, we want to show, um, so we consider two elements of the, met of the abstract metric space big X, okay? And uh, their distance is dij, all right? And then we want to show that the max norm of xi minus xj is equal to dij. That's what we want to show, okay? dij was given. That's, that was the metric uh, connected to big X. All right. So of course, by definition, this is equal to that, okay? And um, now this inequality follows by triangular inequalities here. I'm not gonna read them out to you, but you can probably, stare at them for a, a couple of seconds and convince themselves, convince yourself that they actually hold. So we have this less than or equal to here, okay? And now there is something nice here because a maximum over all K of a quantity that, that does not depend on K is simply the quantity itself, okay? And I can lose uh, the absolute values because D uh, is being a distance is always non-negative. All right. Now, when does max of d i k minus d j k an absolute value over k um, achieves the maximum? Okay, it, it it achieves the maximum if one of these two things is zero. Okay, so when k is in 
exactly i or exactly j, which means that the distance between an element and, and itself is zero, okay? And that means that this less than or equal to, uh, we can actually make it to an equal here, an equal sign. And this concludes the proof. All right, so we've seen what happens or what we can do if we've got a, 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 an abstract metric space and we want to represent it into um, a set of vectors. Uh, it's not, uh, it's a perfect technique with the max norm, but you can't change, change norm. And also it's very high dimensional. So it's not ideal yet. Um, maybe I should just interject. Why would, be, why would be, we be interested into um, embedding an abstract metric space into a, a Euclidean vector space? Um, well, abstract metric spaces are actually um, not so easy to, to come by perhaps, but what we find in, in practical life is approximate abstract metric spaces. Uh, we might um, evaluate a set of people, a set of firms, a set of entities, whatever the entities mean in our real life uh, by means of relations between them. We can sense uh, there is a certain difference between two people. And of course the difference is very complicated to, to express, but maybe we can oversimplify it into a number. Uh, and then we can rank these numbers or use them as ranks, meaning that these two people are more equal to each other than those are those other two people. So this is how abstract, uh, approximately metric spaces may come by. When you uh, look at the world around you and try to evaluate the similarity or dif differences of certain sets of entities. Um, of course, these are not perfect metric spaces in, in, in most, most of the cases, uh, but it's very useful to be able to represent these situations in metrics in Euclidean vector spaces, because then you can uh, tell a computer to draw them, for example, in two dimensions or three dimensions, or you can do clustering uh, on, these, on these entities based on the distances. So this is why uh, we should find this problem interesting, okay, from a very practical point of view. All right, so let's look at what we have in practice usually. Uh, for example, we don't have every distance, okay? So you look at two pairs of different people, okay? And one pair um, has a distance for in your mind, meaning that the, you find these two people different um, as one, it's a unit of difference. And the other two are um, different as two. They are doubly different than the first pair, okay? But you don't have, so you have four people and you have this, which is, which is weighted at one and this, which is weighted at two, but you don't know, you don't have any idea. You don't know how to evaluate these things, okay? These missing distances. So what uh, we're going to look at now are the missing distances, the case of missing distances. Um, so these are um, uh, heuristic methods, of course. Um, they, um, they fall under the name of um, uh, distance matrix, completion, okay? So you've got an incomplete distance matrix D, okay? And by incomplete, I mean that you only know certain components and you don't know some other components, okay? For example, this component. Of course, the distance matrices are um, uh, symmetric, so we only need to look at um, uh, lower uh, and upper triangular parts or lower triangular parts. And we know that being a distance matrix also means that you have zero diagonal, okay? So we cannot define, we cannot do what we did before. We cannot define the vectors UD because we don't, we don't know. We, don't, we wouldn't know how, what to define here, okay? Because we're missing this component, okay? So D, if you read it as a weighted adjacency graph, uh, sorry, weighted adjacency matrix of a graph, actually defines a graph, okay? So one, two, three, and four, uh, these are the vertices and you're missing the distance two, four. Okay, um, the way, one of the ways, one of the most common ways to complete um, distance matrices with missing components is to uh, look at the shortest paths in this graph. Of course, the graph has to be at least connected. Um, if it's not connected, then you, this method won't work. This method will, will only complete the connected components. Okay, but then uh, I don't think you can do any, anything else with the uh, disconnected components anyway. All right. 
so in order to complete uh, a partial matrix with shortest paths, what you can do is use floyd Warshall's algorithm. This is an algorithm, very simple algorithm, that completes um, a distance matrix uh, by means of uh, shortest paths, okay? And the, uh, the only notion that it uses is that it tests repeatedly every triplet of vertices. So U, V, and Z are vertices in this graph. And the question that is going to be uh, repeatedly asked, uh, as asked is, if you're going from U to V, is it more convenient to pass through Z instead? And if it's the case, then you update the distance, the, the current distance UV with a new distance, uh, UZ plus ZV, okay? Instead of this, you cross it off and you replace it by the sum of these two. And otherwise you just go on testing triplets. All right, so this is um, the magnificent form of the formal definition of the floyd Warshall's algorithm. I am saying it is magnificent because it's it's got this very apparently simple uh, structure of three embedded loops and a single test inside. Now, the only thing that you mustn't get wrong when implementing this very easy algorithm is to switch the order of these three loops, okay? So the new vertex that you're using to triangulate Z must be the external loop. Okay, that's the only thing to uh, take care of. All right, so we talked about the practical uh, usefulness of, the, of this business of representing abstract metric spaces into a vector space. Um, and we've seen the case of missing distances. Now let's see the other case, which is much more relevant, meaning noisy distances. You have your own idea of how two people dif differ and you can never explain it to anyone because it's your feeling perhaps, but you can still attach a number to it. Okay, so these distances are very noisy, meaning that they are uh, not distances at all. All right, and that takes me to Schoenberg's theorem. Um, Schoenberg wrote uh, this very short um, uh, paper on the Annals of Mathematics in 1935. Oh, by the way, Schoenberg is a, fa a famous geometer. He invented splines, by the way. And he also uh, worked on, this, on these matters. So the paper has a very long title, and uh, it, the title is almost as long as the paper itself. Remarks to Maurice Frechet's article uh, sur la définition axiomatique d'une classe d'espaces distanciés vectoriellement applicable sur l'espace d'Hilbert. De Hilbert. Pardon. Okay, so um, this, uh, this paper, this short paper, asks the question, when is a given matrix a Euclidean distance matrix? So when my, does my feeling uh, of distance of or differences on a set of entities in the real world, world correspond to a Euclidean distance matrix? Okay, Euclidean meaning that now the norm is Euclidean. And the theorem proved by Schoenberg says that uh, a given D is an EDM, this is a symmetric matrix with zero diagonal, and it's an EDM if and only if this other matrix, okay, is PSD of rank K. And the rank K, well, it depends. K was not given here as an input, okay? So you can just read it's PSD, okay? It will have a certain rank. But you can ask, the actual, the theorem actually asks, given uh, a matrix, when is it a, a Euclidean distance matrix of rank K, okay? This is what the theorem actually asks, and this is the formal statement of the theorem. I'm not going to prove this theorem to you, but uh, I'm going to just um, um, sort of steal the idea of positive semi-definiteness here, because I'm going, to, I'm going to use it later, okay? Uh, now, the, there is a useful variant of this theorem, and it's a variant only because it refers to PSD. Um, it's, uh, the, the methods of proofs are fairly different. Um, there's obviously a, a relationship between them. Um, but it, it says that uh, essentially D is a squared Euclidean distance, well, D squared is a squared Euclidean distance matrix, so D is a, dis a Euclidean distance matrix, if and only if, um, if you do this linear operation on it, you obtain um, a PSD matrix, okay? So let me parse this result first, and then we'll set out to prove it or prove part of it because it's a boring proof. Um, okay, so let's, let's start from a realization, okay? A distance matrix is going to be 
a, well, so um, a matrix, a given matrix, is going to be a Euclidean distance matrix if there exists um, a realization of the or embedding of the matrix in uh, a certain space RK, okay? And this embedding will have to give me positions in RK for each of the vertices of uh, of the of the matrix, uh, each of the rows or columns of the matrix, okay? So the distance matrix Dij measures the distance between entity I and entity J, okay? And so I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to need an xi and xj and an xj such that their squared, their Euclidean norm is going to be equal to uh, the ij. So uh, the um, certificate that proves that this is really a distance matrix is going to be this, this uh, um, embedding. Okay, so this embedding, I wrote it as a sequence of vectors. Each one of these things is a vector. It's not a scalar, it's a X1 is a vector in RK, X2 is a vector in, in RK and so on. Okay, so this, this X here is actually an N times K matrix. Okay, so I'm reading it um, as if the vectors were uh, rows. Okay, so X11 up to X1K, and then x21 up to x2k and so on xn1 up to xnk okay so this is my n times k matrix now if i take this matrix g obtained by this n times k matrix times is transpose, I'm going to have an n times n matrix, okay? And um, this matrix G is called the gram matrix of X, okay? So the gram matrix of X has a property that it is positive semi-definite. Moreover, every positive semi-definite matrix is also a gram matrix of some X for some K. Okay, so these two classes of gram matrices and positive semi-definite matrices are the same class. Okay, they are equal classes. Um, all right, so essentially this result says, well, D is a Euclidean distance matrix if and only if you if you do this operation here that I haven't really explained yet, you get uh, something which is positive semi-definite, which is a gram matrix. All right, okay. So what is this J D squared J? Well. J is a matrix which is called the centering matrix, and it's an identity minus one over n, the matrix of all ones. One times one transpose would be one times one transpose like this. So every entry here is one. Okay. And this is the explicit form of the centering matrix. Okay. So what happens here? Um, what's happening is that we now have a tool for dealing with um our own idea of a metric of an abstract metrics metric with uh, with wrong distances with distances that are not really distances they're just numbers that we assign to these entities okay so um suppose we have this d tilde this is our idea of distances between entities in in a set okay so our idea of how people differ or how buildings differ and this is just whatever numbers we we think of okay um, they will probably be cl close to some kind of distance but maybe even not all right so what we do what we the, the preciousness of, of this operation is that it doesn't depend on d you given this centering matrix j you can always form the matrix j times d squared times j times a half uh, and invert the, the sign. You can always do that, all right? So we can do that also with D tilde, our own idea of, uh, of a distance matrix, well, of a wrong distance matrix, really. All right, so what we get here is G tilde, okay? So G tilde is not going to be a gram because D tilde was not a Euclidean distance matrix and our theorem was if and only if. This is not going to be a gram matrix. However, however, we can still carry out the spectral decomposition of G tilde. And we're going to obtain something like P, that's a, a matrix of eigenvectors, orthogonal, uh, lambda tilde, diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, uh, and then 
uh, p-transpose, okay? So that's the spectral composition. And because we know that G tilde is not going to be PSD, um, we uh, also know that lambda tilde is, going, is not going to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? I.e. some of the eigenvalues of this G tilde will be negative, all right? We can find the closest PSD diagonal matrix to lambda tilde very easily by zeroing the negative components of lambda tilde. So if you had, if your lambda tilde had two, one, one, zero, minus one, minus one, okay, that would be lambda tilde. You would simply replace these things by zero, okay? So you decrease, you lose some rank, okay? But at least you get something which is a positive semi-definite. So you can plug this new lambda all right, this is lambda now with the zeros there. You can plug it here. And um, now this lambda, because it's non-negative, you can define a square root of it and it exists in the, in the sense that it's real. Okay, the, the square root is real. Um, now, since this is real, you can essentially uh, rewrite the spectral decomposition like P, square root of lambda, oops, square root of lambda, square root of lambda, P transpose. Okay, so we've, re re uh, we've rewritten uh, this matrix product like that. And now you can see that it is apparent, uh, the, the gram matrix structure is apparent. Now we have um, a real vector here and a real vector, um, sorry, it's not a vector, a real matrix here and a real matrix here, okay? And this is going to be the rank if, if we have here k uh, non negative eigenvalues, sorry, positive eigenvalues, then this is going to be n times k, and this is going to be uh, k, k times n, k times n. And now I can take one of the parts, or it's the, the transpose, but let's say this part, I can take this part to mean the realization. Okay, so now I have an approximate embedding of D tilde, because I, I, I've lost some rank here, okay, in zeroing these, these uh, uh, negative eigenvalues. But at least it's the closest I could get to my funny, impossible idea of a distance uh, that my own feelings suggested uh, for, uh, for this differences of, of these entities. Okay, so we can now find some kind of, uh, embedding in the Euclidean vector of some dimension k, okay? We don't control yet this dimension, okay? And this dimension may be smaller than n, uh, the number of um, entities in the metric space, but at least we've got something. Okay, so um, there are two parts to this proof. First, uh, proof the lemma, i.e. a matrix is gram if and only if it is PSD. And the other part is that G is equal to this, okay? This is easy and extremely boring. It basically consists of a set of replacements, um, algebraic sub substitutions. Um, I've not found a nice proof for this, so I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna give it to you. And this is probably known by almost everybody here, um, but it's so short and in a certain sense so sweet that I don't see why I should skip it. Um, okay, so, oh, maybe I do why I should skip it because it's 634. So maybe I will skip it, but you'll have access to these slides. There is nothing difficult here, absolutely nothing. All right, so, and Schoenberg's, well, Schoenberg, this is not Schoenberg, this is the other theorem, the variant, okay? And you will read this thing, you will see uh, that it's um, very easy. The only part that I didn't put is this last part, but again, it's messy, but easy. All right, so let's move to principal component analysis. This is a workhorse of data science. And um, in the derivation that I gave of multidimensional scaling, um, it derives pretty much very easily from it. Okay, let's see. Again, we're given an approximate distance matrix D, all right? And we, are, we know how to find um, a real, an embedding in our K some, for some K. Okay, K is not given. It's the multiple dimensional scaling operation that finds, uh, that preserves all of the positive eigenvalues of the spectral composition of D, uh, sorry, of the gram matrix of, uh, corresponding to D. 
All right. So, but now you are given. We are. We want some precise k. We want, for example, to depict this distance um, situation that we've got in mind into uh, the plane, into a, on a piece of paper. So we know that k is equal to two. All right. Uh, but now this rank of lambda that we uh, that we used that we saw uh, when doing multi-dimensional scaling, um, it's bigger. It's bigger than our k. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can only keep the k largest components of lambda. Okay, and we're going to zero the rest. If we had two, two, one, zero, minus one, minus one in our idea of lambda tilde before and we zeroed these last two. Well, now if we want two dimensions only, we're gonna zero this one as well. So we lose more rank. We, we lose even more information from the, from the gram matrix, uh, i.e. the distance matrix. Uh, it, it means that our own idea of distances on the, this abstract, abstract metric is really not that faithful. I mean, the, 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 how, the more uh, you, uh, the more um, uh, eigenvalues you zero and then the less faithful is going to be. Uh, but nonetheless, we're keeping the largest. So um, if your matrix is, um, I don't know, is like 10 to the sixth and 10 to the five and one, for example, and then zero and then minus one, then that would be fine, okay? Because most of the weight is around these two dimensions. <laughs> Can happen. Okay. All right. So for example, you take this graph. This graph defines uh, a distance matrix, um, if you weigh by one, all of these edges, okay, uh, then you can see that you've got uh, an adjacency matrix of the, of the graph. And um, the, we don't know the distances of anything that doesn't have a one, essentially. What is the difference, the distance between Gordon and Plücker, for example? Well, um, we can complete that now with the uh, information that I gave you so far, we can complete uh, this uh, partial matrix uh, using shortest paths. So we can do this, whoops. Okay, and now it's one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight. So Gord Gordon and Plücker uh, have distance eight. And now we complete all of this um, partial matrix and we obtain something like this. This is only a part of the uh, genealogy that I presented before. And now we can apply um, PCA, principal component analysis, for example, in 2D and in 3D. You can see that in both 2D and 3D, there is a certain cluster that emerges. And if you go and look at the names, uh, it corresponds to something around here, okay, which is somehow clustering there. And uh, there's also that that emerges. So these, these ways of uh, losing information did not lose too much. Uh, at least preserved some of the clustering um, on the graph got preserved into the Euclidean spaces. So that seems useful. And in fact, it is. All right, so um, this is a summary. Isomap is a method um, for dimensionality reduction. And I think it summarizes what I said so far. Um, Isomap takes a, a, a set of points that have been somehow sampled noisily from a process and this process uh, lays the points into some nonlinear uh, manifold in a high, higher dimensional manifold. Look at the example here. Um, for example, you have you have these points, and you can see that they are all on this sort of Swiss roll. That's what it's called. It's a two D shape, okay, but it's nonlinearly folded, and so it's not so apparent that uh, what the equations of the manifolds are, okay. So what isomap tells you to do is it tells you to uh, draw a, 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 a disk graph. Okay, so for each of the points, you would choose, a, well, you would choose a, a radius for a neighborhood, and then you would start connecting all of the neighboring points so that you, this this uh, surface would be, well, there, it would host a graph. Okay, a, a disk graph. And once it's hosted this graph, and you've got this graph, what you can do. Um, is you can complete it using, using shortest paths and then use PCA to decrease the dimensionality. So that's what we've been doing so far. So geometrically, why would it work? If you look at this, for example, suppose that you were trying to, um, to compute the Euclidean distance between these two points. If you didn't know that these two points were part of a, of a lower dimensional manifold, your distance should be 
the shortest path. Well, the shortest segment, sorry, uh, the, <laughs> the segment. Okay, so the length of the segment. Um, so this distance would completely lose the structure of uh, the um, of the manifold that is that that is hidden that you don't know. Okay, but having formed these disk graphs, there are uh, th there's there's little um, risk that you're going to pair up these very far away points unless your neighborhood radius is too large, for example, okay? But if your neighborhood ra radius is small enough, then you will end up with something with this graph whereby the shortest path on the graph really does correspond more closely to the segment in 2D, which is the inherent dimensionality of this manifold, than the segment in 3D, which was just a, a lifting of the natural dimension of these points for reasons unknown, okay? So this is, why uh, this isomap, well, visually. This is a visual interpretation of what isomap can do for you. And isomap is essentially what I've been describing so far. Okay. Now, I want to introduce the distance geometry problem now, um, and not only the embedding problem. In the distance geometry problem, the object of interest is a graph. It is not uh, a distance matrix, however partial. Uh, the two problems are related, of course, but there are some differences. Anyway, so here's the definition. We're given the integer k, okay? So we're given the dimensionality where we want to uh, realize the vertices of this graph. Given k and given the graph g, okay, which is uh, undirected and simple, so there are no loops or parallel edges, um, the vertices are called v, the edges d, and d is a distance function, which is non-negative. It's an edge weight that labels the edges and essentially uh, works like our idea of the distances between two entities, okay? So that it's associated to every edge because every edge is a relation between two vertices. We want to find or we want to decide whether there exists a realization function f that maps the vertices of the graph to uh, vectors in Rk in such a way that this constraint set holds. What does this constraint set say? It says that for every edge in E, the Euclidean distance between the vectors assigned to E, to I, and to J um, is going to be equal, exactly equal to D squared IJ, okay? D was part of the given, K was part of the given, um, and we have to decide whether there exists this function that maps V to RK, okay? So in going from uh, Euclidean metric space into vector space where uh, the, the solution of the problem was called an embedding, if we go to, if we move to the graph setting, um, the solution of the problem is called the realization. Both solutions are representable as n, n times k matrices, of course. So there's no difference, okay? They, they tell you where the points uh, lie in the vector space, okay? But the name is different. Okay, uh, embedding is more general. It, it can also, it, it also concerns uh, drawing, um, well, representing metrics in on topological, in topological spaces, so more general spaces. So realization concerns Euclidean spaces. Okay, so uh, another way to explain what this problem asks is that given a weighted graph like this one, um, this, numbers are not the weights, these numbers are the vertices, and you must imagine that these, each of these edges are weighted, okay? We want to draw it so that the edges are, uh, are drawn as segments with lengths equals to the weights, okay? So here are two drawings. They both satisfy all the uh, edges. The dotted line here, the dotted line here corresponds to a distance which is not given, okay? So there are two um, uh, isometric uh, drawings here. Okay. Now let's see some applications. I want to present three applications in particular, and uh, one has k equals one, the other has k equals two, and the third has k equals three. And then there's another uh, application where k can be whatever. Okay, clock synchronization. Here, 
we want to determine a set of unknown timestamps from partial measurements of their time differences. Okay, so we want to determine the actual time at certain points given time differences. Accordingly, we only have to work on the timeline, which is a single real line, which is why k is equals to one, is equal to one. The set of vertices is a set of timestamps. And uh, we have an edge between two vertices if we know the time difference between u and v. And d uh, maps to the values of the time differences. Okay, This is used in time synchronization of distributed networks uh, when the mobile sensors have a very limited battery and they have to last forever. Um, you don't want to use battery even to, you, you don't want to waste any kind of battery, even just to send a timestamp. That would be too long, the whole timestamp. Sending one scalar, which is a difference, is much more efficient. So uh, so at some point, somewhere, there must be a central server that collects all of the time differences and, is, and, and has an absolute, has an idea of an absolute clock and works out all of the absolute times at all, all of the mobile sensors, sensors. Okay, so here we see a representation of an example. Uh, for example, you have the central server, the atomic clock, that knows it knows that it's uh, 1627, and it knows that there is a time difference of five to Alice, and Alice is a difference of three to Chuck and seven to Bob, and Bob has four times this uh, time difference of four to Chuck. Okay, so all of these scalars can are routed through the network and reach the atomic clock, and that must it must take, um, which must take a decision. Um, so this is a representation of a timeline, and the timeline has something wonderful. There's something wonderful about k equals 1. It's that the only decision you must make here is whether it's left or right, okay? So here, you know that there is a time difference of 5 from this time uh, to Alice, okay? So it's either 1622 or uh, 32, okay, which is over here. So you must decide whether it's left or right that you want to position this uh, new time, okay? And accordingly, when, when you've decided, for example, for Alice, uh, you can place Bob at seven away here or seven away here, okay? And if you had chosen this point for Alice, Alice Prime, then Bob would be seven away here, here probably, and uh, seven away in the other direction, which I don't, I don't even have space to write, okay? And again, from Alice, you can decide Chuck, um, and Chuck has to be either here or uh, here, okay? But now, lo and behold, you know that Bob and Chuck have a difference of five, okay? So the this kind of prunes away a lot of the possibilities because this has a difference of, five, of, of uh, four, sorry, four, whereas many of the other points don't, okay? So in this wonderful setting of the timeline where you only have to decide left or right, uh, you see that there is a certain magic that occurs um, and, um, and we are able to take, to make some, some discrete decisions. I've exploited this discrete decision also in higher dimensions, um, but it's, I'm not gonna talk about it in this course. Okay, so, uh, the case with k equals 2, uh, classical case is sensor network localization. Um, and this is only to, uh, after doing some, performing some research on the history of distance geometry, I ascribe to um, this particular paper, or which is uh, basically a, just a, a very short uh, proceedings paper, which is called a draft of an inter, no, uh, a, uh, a draft of an intermediate result or something. It was a very, very cautious title anyway. Um, so this is the first time where there was mention, there was a mention of uh, an interest into realizing a graph which wasn't complete. Okay, so in all of the references that I checked before 1978, um, we only had realization problems on complete graphs, or rather, embedding problems on uh, complete distance matrices. I don't know whether this is true. This is what I found so far, okay? But I, I don't know whether this is actually the case. All right. Um, so uh, what is the, 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 the problem? What is the application here? Well, the application is, again, you have parachuted mobile sensor somewhere um, and you have, um, so the set of vertices is the mobile sensors and you have distances u, u uh, times uh, u comma v. 
uh, you know, have edges between these two in the graph if the distance is measured, okay? How do you measure these distances in real life? Because you know how much battery you are using when you perform a peer-to-peer -peer communication between two sensors. If two sensors are too far enough, they will try to get into a peer-to-peer -peer communication, but they will fail, okay? So there'll be no, no edge there. But if they are close enough, okay, then they will engage successfully into peer-to-peer -peer communication and they will send some packets and they will measure how, man, how much battery they have used in sending some packets. If they are far, but not too, if they are close, but not too close, uh, then they will just about manage to get in touch and they'll use a lot of battery to, to send each other packets, okay? So this is how you estimate the Euclidean distance. Of course, if you are uh, surrounded by walls, the distance is no longer Euclidean, but this is swept under the carpet. Um, also, if, if you have carpets, actually, probably the distance is not gonna be Euclidean. Um, okay, so why is this useful? Well, it's useful when GPS is not viable. For example, if your mobile sensors are in a forest, or underwater. For example, if you are trying to control a fleet of automated uh, underwater vehicles. And this is the depiction of what happens when you have the graph and then you realize it into the office floor. Okay, um, 3D, that's my favorite applications, application uh, on which I worked for long years, molecular structure from distance data. Certain types of uh, analysis allow you to retrieve directly the position of the atoms, well, not directly, indirectly, but they allow you at least to, to retrieve um, almost directly the position of the atoms from whatever the experiment gives you, okay? Um, so we're talking about proteins here, uh, mostly. So in, why are we talking about proteins? Because proteins are very useful to our body, okay? If, if we design a drug, most of the times we want to in, the drug to interact with a cell, okay? And um, if it's got to interact with a cell uh, and, hasn't, and can't be too destructive, it probably has to be a protein um, or some kind of complicated molecule on the surface of the cell. And it has to bind to the surface of the cell into certain sites. And these sites have a shape for receiving the the outside molecule and the molecule has got to be a, has got to have a certain shape in order to bind to that site okay so these molecules they're not just important because of their chemical formulae that's important too okay but that's easier to 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 ascertain um but it's also important how these these molecules fold in space or what shape they assume in space okay so this is why we're interested in the shape of these molecules anyway so when the molecule crystallizes, you can use X-ray crystallography, which pretty much tells you the site of the atom already. Uh, but if the uh, molecule, usually like proteins do, live in liquids, it doesn't crystallize very easily, in which case uh, you have to apply a different time, uh, type of strategy. And that's one of the strategies, one of the most popular strategies uh, for a number of years um, has been NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So that doesn't give you even indirectly the position of the atoms, but it gives you indirectly the molecule graph, i.e. it tells you what, uh, what atoms are nearby, okay? And what atoms are far away. Uh, in fact, it, it tells you the, the distances up to 5.5 angstrom, okay? So, and this is not precise. It tells you these distances imprecisely, and also it gets it wrong on say 5% to 10% of the distances, meaning that maybe it tells you that uh, these two are close when they're not close at all, okay? So there are two types of errors, but let's sweep everything under the carpet here. Let's just pretend that we have the molecule graph. And if you have the molecule graph, then you can uh, use distance, you can solve a distance geometry problem and retrieve the molecule shape. All right, so if this is an application where K can be anything. Um, nowadays, if you want to use clustering, if you want to use an artificial neural network, um, you need to represent whatever it is that you're trying to learn via a vector, okay? So if your data is rep, uh, relational and it's best represented by a graph, you're out of luck 
because a graph is not a vector. So you can't pass it to the input neurons of an artificial neural network, uh, or you can't cluster it using k-means because k-means only applies to Euclidean vectors, okay? Um, so what can you do? Well, you can transform this graph. You can represent the graph by, via a vector. And uh, there are ways to do that in both uh, um, for k-means and also for artificial neural networks. Um, the solving a distance geometry problem has really not come up in that kind of literature uh, as far as I could see. So I proposed to try these things, to try using distance geometry methods in order to uh, turn graphs into vectors and feed them into an artificial neural network or to cluster them using k-means, okay? So this is uh, the storyline that I that the next two lectures will take. I'm going to give you some methods for uh, for solving distance geometry problems. And then having given you methods, these methods, I'm going to try and use an artificial neural network for uh, learning the similarity of some, se some sentences in natural language. And these sentences were translated into vectors using distance geometry. Okay, so we come to a nice place where I can stop. And so perhaps I'm going to stop here. Okay. Thank you much, very much, Leo. So you actually left a few minutes for questions. Yes. There were a couple of questions in the chat, which uh, I, I hopefully gave the right answer. It was uh -huh. just one specific person about the, uh, the matrix J. Is so it orthogonal? Guess, yeah, if it was orthogonal. Uh, if it was an orthogonal projection. Is it? I've never thought about this. I don't think it is orthogonal. Is it? It's an orthogonal projection. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, the identity minus one over N. Yes, one times one. Yes, it's the orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal complement of ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the question I could have asked. Okay. All right. So uh, then, detailed asymmetric? No. Well, uh, yes, it should have to be. Um, yes, detailed is, is assumed symmetric. So that depends. So in in my uh, way of uh, so when I said that this was useful practically, basically you'd, you'd have an idea between the about the difference uh, between things, okay? If there is a difference between I and J, I'm hoping that your mind does not assign a different value between the difference between I and J and J and I. So detailed is symmetric. Okay, then how does the formula R plus I X equals derived at the beginning? So that is basically because if you can, if you see this in the, so there was basically this, uh, uh, this situation R X. Okay. And you can see this in the complex plane. Okay. This is the complex plane. And then uh, this was called alpha. And now this, um, uh, this complex number, this vector in 2D is a complex number, represents a complex number. And the complex number, you can write it as, uh, uh, R on the real line plus uh, X, I, X in the imaginary line, but you can also write it in polar form. And the polar form is the length U here, uh, U E to the um, uh, I times alpha. Uh, oops. I times alpha. Alpha. Okay. Am I familiar with any results using graph neural networks to solve distance geometry problems? Um, Graph. No, no, I'm not familiar with uh, any of the resu results, but uh, this is just out of ignorance, meaning that graph neural networks is something I haven't looked at yet. I've looked at it mm, very briefly. Let's say I didn't understand them fully. Um, and uh, I don't, um, so I don't know. Uh, Philip, are you, uh, are you familiar? Well, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, just a little bit. Uh, there's a recent paper doing uh, molecular conformation mm -hmm. using 
uh, using graph neural networks. And they use a distance geometric description of a molecule. Um, I, can, I can send a link to the paper in the chat. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much.